Welcome everyone to the fourth episode of Inspire series. Clearly we live in very challenging times uh, for all of us and so while we all remain committed to make our business successful and tackle the challenges around restarting our economy, it is also very important that we find ways to bring inspiration to our own day. So thank you so much for making time today to watch what promised to be a very insightful event in our OCO Inspire series. Last week, we spoke to Snow Shaw, the Managing Director of Refinitiv Business Accelerator, where she shared her experiences in creating, investing in, and scaling new hyper-growth opportunities. Uh, it was very you know, good to hear some of her thoughts. Uh, this week, however, we have something totally different. Uh, we're speaking to John Flismus, my notes say former comedian, but uh, I don't know if a comedian ever stops being a comedian. So let's just say current comedian, but also a lecturer, businessman, and social commentator. And we're going to be talking to him about how to pivot your organization by expanding your mind. And I think this is massively important in situations like this where we have a one in you know, 30 or a one in 100 year event. We really need to clean sheet everything, start from the beginning and rethink about the future. As I've said before, the past is never really a great indicator of what the future is going to be. So um, we'll hand over to Colin from Innovation Catalysts, who will facilitate the conversation and uh, John will, will talk about learning from the future and pivoting your organization. Thanks, John. Thanks, Colin. And uh, thank you very much, Stephen, and a big welcome to all of the attendees. Thank you very much for joining. And if you've been on uh, previous calls, well, a double thanks for coming back. Um, John, I'm going to introduce you in a minute, but I want to go and do something as a wee experiment. It's not the most uh, tricky experiment. It should work. But for our attendees, I'm just going to run a quick poll. And I'm launching it right now. If you could just answer these two questions, hopefully it will become clear why I've asked them later on in this particular session. I've just launched the poll right now. As you're um, having a look at the poll, the, the title we've gone for is um, Pivot an Organization by Expanding Your Mind. And I'm really excited about this one because if anyone is going to help expand our minds, it's going to be John. And I really want to get in over the next hour to his experiences, both in his entrepreneurial life, I guess he's still an entrepreneurial life, and particularly over the last couple of months, the last six months, where he's been playing an incredibly active role at Henley Business School. And I'm sure you've all heard of Henley Business School, but this is the number one business school in Africa without question from the awards that it wins and from the feedback that it gets from its corporate clients. And globally, it is recognized as well. Over the last couple of months, as we've gone into COVID-19, they've had to do some incredible things, and we're going to and dig into that story. Right, let's just have a quick look at the poll first. I'm just going to end it now and see what we've got and then share it back with everyone. I'm very curious about this. You should be able to see that. Does your organization hire weirdos and misfits? Okay, 60%, 86% one more. Okay, that's a great start. I'm interested in that. John. Welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> let's, uh, let's start um, at the beginning. So I'm sure everyone does know you. How do you go from, well, how do you get into becoming a comedian? And then how do you go from being a very well-known and a very good comedian, a very funny comedian, to becoming someone that is actually supporting a business school? Those two things do not seem, uh, the, the juxtapositions in terms of where you'd expect a career to go. Well, okay, so the first question is how do you become a comedian? It's always good to be deeply insecure as a child and, uh, and desperately want to belong uh, to a group of people who will later grow up to become largely average. Um, and you'll try very hard. <clears throat> and finally, you'll find that the greatest strategy is to um, stand out and away from them and outside the group and comment on the group, become an observer. That would be my best answer to that. And also making people laugh makes them more interested in you. And in my case, girls... And that was very useful. Um, and so I was nerdy and uh, not an alpha male. And, um, and uh, today, the people who were in the rugby team and, um, and were sort of the alpha males um, sell insurance and slowly lose their hair and, and, um, and become less and less um, uh, manly. Um, so that was the comedy side. Um, then just a quick question on that. Can yeah. anyone become a comedian? 
No, um, everyone will try, um, but it takes quite serious pathology. Some people call it talent, but I would say it's a mixture of um, negative drivers largely and, uh, and um, possibly uh, trauma um, and uh, insecurity and neediness. So it's quite a list of things that most people don't look for in a comedian. Uh, normally what they do is they find their friend at the Bry, Dennis, who they think is hilarious. And they say, oh, he'd be a great comedian. Well, he wouldn't because uh, there's a great difference between being pretty good in bed and being a professional sex worker. There's a huge difference between those two things. So, so um, no, not everyone can be a comedian. I don't think it can be taught. Um, I think it's not always a talent. Sometimes it's actually a pathology. So, so since I've left comedy, which to answer your second question, uh, I feel a lot more peaceful as a human being, uh, a lot more focused. And um, um, for me, I, I, there are many great comedians who I love and friends of mine and, and, and heroes who I think should be comedians. But for me, it was a better choice as a human to not be a comedian. Well, I'm gonna, we're we're going to come back to that later. So um, you're not supporting Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours of practice here at this moment. But no. we're going to come back and ask you a different question about whether people can become leaders. I'm just forewarning you. Yes. I want to know whether, in your opinion, everyone can also become a leader. But we're not allowed to answer that now because we need to go, go through the journey. So. Sure. With your, your um, negative drivers, your insecurity, your uh, background, which uh, landed you into becoming an incredibly good comedian, what was the transition? How did you then start to go on this journey where you wanted to go and get involved with something like Henley Business School? Um, so I met John Foster Pedley, the Dean of Henley, many years ago. Before he was the Dean of Henley, he was actually a very, very good strategy lecturer at uh, the Graduate School of Business in Cape Town. John and I met through a mutual uh, business um, acquaintance and, and had lunch. <clears throat> and uh, in that lunch, I, I suddenly realized that I was in the process of meeting one of the best teachers I would ever meet. And we formed a friendship um, and, and uh, a mentorship, probably, um, if I'm honest. And, um, and over the years, John uh, was a teacher for me uh, in his own way. And he got me to go and speak to his students, his MBA students in Cape Town while he was um, handling um, that. And, uh, and then those students tore apart what I had to say again and again. And um, over, the, over the years, I got used to being mauled by people who thought they were much cleverer than they really were. And because and, um, that's what happens, right, with an MBA is you suddenly feel like you're a superior human being. And, and uh, so, so I used that time to refine what I was thinking and what I was doing, what I was reading, <clears throat> and became interested in learning. And then ultimately, in a true act of hypocrisy, uh, joined the club and began to study in India and, and, um, and found that, um, and I'm still doing that, by the way, I, I've taken two breaks. Another seminal moment in my life changed was my dad dying. I took off uh, nine months to look after my dad. He had a stroke and, uh, and I did a terrible job of looking after him because he passed away. Uh, and um, we were very close, very, very close. And uh, it was a very big moment for me. I began to study and I'm very glad my dad saw me begin my studies before he died, because I think it was important for him to know that I had this other angle. Um, although he loved my comedy, uh, he said, um, but um, so, so as my dad passed away, it was the moment my dad died. I was with him for five very, very intense months before he passed away. But, but as he died, and I've been with him the whole time, um, I made a joke to my mum. And that was like, at that moment, it was like, uh, it was my irreverence being my highest form of reverence for my dad because I genuinely, one of my favorite human beings on earth. And um, I realized that that joke was enough. It was my final like thing. And, and I, so I wrote a show about my dad and about death, uh, about death and about how humans process endings. And, uh, and I knew after reenacting my dad's death on stage for six weeks in a row that that was it. That was all I had to do. I finished with that chapter and I wanted to fully move into to teaching because while I was studying, I began to teach uh, on, on, on some of the Henley executive education courses. And, um, and that was it. I just, I just transitioned into this, swapped the stage for the classroom. And, and for me, it's actually, it's not, a, it's not a change. I was once very lucky to interview Cat Stevens, uh, um, uh, Yusuf Islam. And I asked him about the change in his life from being Cat Stevens to Yusuf Islam. And he said, John, why do you have to call it a change? Why can't it just be an evolution? And that's, uh, it was a very good point. I think it's just an evolution. So tell me about um, Henley then. Tell me uh, at a high level what it does and um, how it does it. So, so Henley is the business school um, owned by Reading University in England. Uh, it's one of the oldest business schools in Europe. Uh, it opened its Africa operation uh, quite some time ago, but John uh, became the dean of Henley roughly 10 years ago. 
And in that time, he's grown the size of Henley substantially. Um, I'm, I, I, I feel like it's 2,000% growth um, and, um, and has made it one of the leading schools in Africa. Um, and I think one of the reasons why John is a great uh, leader is because he is that teacher. He's quite a fearless teacher. He's a strategist, but quite radical um, as far as deans go. I've met a couple of deans. I just find that uh, John is a, is, a deeply, um, is a deep mix of looking for new ways to teach and also appreciating the heritage of where the school comes from. So it's, it's quite an exciting place. Um, I've recently become the head of marketing as well, um, and we are retelling the Henley story. So um, it's, it's a, it's a, it, what's great about Henley Africa is we are very open and, and um, inclusive of uh, things that make Africa Africa and wrapping those into the teaching. So the faculty is diverse, um, and the, the way in which John employs people is really, really um, inclusive and, and brilliant. And the way he listens to people within the community of Henley leads to a, quite a frustrating process, but it's deeply rewarding because it's challenging intellectually. And it constantly forces you to look at your own bias, your own prejudice, your own frameworks, and the way in which you form uh, your perception. Because as we now know, perception is a fluid thing. It can never be uh, defined in one way by one person. And just to that point, uh, the thing you said about Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours, has been disproved. Um, you cannot do something like that. It's not a, it's not a guarantee. Some people can do it in 4,000 hours if they have a natural affinity, and some will never get there. So number one business school in Africa, or internationally actually, is uh, recognized by the Financial Times. What exactly is the intent for John and for you guys? What are you trying to do? Um, so in a nutshell, uh, we would like to improve the business education landscape of Africa in order to build uh, more value uh, within Africa. So our, our motto is always that we build the people that build the businesses that build Africa. And, 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 uh, but really, if, if what I understand with John, so we, are, we give away more education than any other institution in Africa. Um, we're, we're interested in educating people as quickly and as well as we can in order to face the issues that Africa faces with better skills and better capability. And the model, how did that typically work? So pre-COVID-19, what's the usual approach for, you know, the business schools and, and Henley in particular that are out there? Because I've always had the feeling that they are fairly similar, fairly standard. And in some ways, the, the whole MBA title has started to wane over the last yeah. number of years. And, and it's sort of lost some of that polish where it was a must have if you wanted to go up the leadership ranks in an organization. And now it's become a, do you really need it? Is it really adding value? Hmm. Um, so I would agree. Uh, I, I have neck tattoos. I don't really belong in an MBA classroom if you think of the traditional business school model. Um, but what I get out of it, as a, so I can give you my own experience, is number one, non-judgment, which is very, very big for me at Henley. It's, it's a, there's a low is a low judgment, uh, which I find really important because in our country, uh, there is a lot of intimidation around education. There are a lot of high barriers to entry. So I would agree with you that the MBA seen as an elitist thing is a bad idea. And there are many of those people in the world now. However, the, the rigor and the framework that you have to go through, particularly myself from not a very academic background, but a business management background, uh, to train my mind uh, to think better and become a better analyst, I don't think that there's a better thing you can do if you're in the business world than go through the, the high pressure kind of like um, process of an MBA and particularly one that's very rigorous. So, so um, I like the fact that pre-COVID, uh, PhDs from all over the world were flying in to give us lectures. And so you might need someone from the States, from Germany, from the UK, from Ghana, um, and from Nigeria. So you get a very rich set of quite youngish um, um, senior academics and then they zip off again and then you, you talk to them on, on email. Now we are basically doing all of that but on Zoom. So all that's done is allow us even more free movement of uh, a, a world-class set of global um, teachers and that's been quite exciting. So let, let's start tapping into that because um, I think it's even on your uh, website, you're obviously very proud of it, you've got this 12-day pivot and yeah. actually this is perhaps 
the uh, the number one reason why I was really excited about getting you on, even more than just this, you know, your your history and your legacy, and actually getting to talk to someone that's incredibly funny, even if you're not going to do stand up comedy anymore. <laughs> How on earth, or what was that journey? How do you do a twelve day pivot? Because schools, educational systems, business schools in general, when I come across them, are incredibly staid and static and conventional, which is a shame in a world where we need exactly the reverse of that. What happened? What did you do? Well, well, John basically announced that the school needs to go virtual. Um, we, he, he was very aware of the, uh, the COVID research around the world. He watched the, the virus um, move from Asia. He was tracking it for quite a long time, reading all the best research. Uh, John's got an incredible appetite for uh, research. He, he reads incredibly quickly and assimilates things very, very fast. So, so, so he was basically uh, putting together a team, and I, I like your poll because basically a bunch of crazy people uh, were assembled. Uh, and that's across... His faculty, uh, it's across, uh, you know, technology. Uh, there's an excellent technology partner that we have. Um, then I was brought in as the marketing person. Uh, and we basically knew we had to get a school that is one of the most rigorously accredited across Africa. We have triple accreditations, really. In fact, if you count South African accreditation, we have four sets of accreditation. We had to move online, but that didn't mean giving everyone a mobile phone. What it meant was moving our delivery system online in time in a way that satisfied all of the requirements of all of the accreditation bodies. So, so genuinely we moved on online as quickly as possible. Um, it, it was a mad idea and we didn't sleep much for that time, but, but the concept was that nobody got left behind who didn't want to be left behind. And I'm really proud to say not only did we retain all of our students, but we're the only Henley uh, unit in the world that's grown our portfolio during COVID and lockdown. So we've actually just opened another MBA intake for this year, which is unheard of. We've done five before, which is our record. We've just done number six. And we have 12 new launches between now and the end of the year, which is normally a quiet academic time because intakes are wrapping up. So we rapidly developed uh, short courses in executive education. Um, we looked at how we deliver the, the, the accredited courses. So everything from a an NQF level five, which is a higher certificate, and that comes just off in the trick, all the way up five, six. Um, we didn't have a level seven. We've just had that accredited and we've launched that this week. So, so we now have every single step in the ladder from post matric all the way up to um, masters. And, um, and so we got all of those online, uh, put the faculty under quite big pressure, um, bent our own minds around what education means got our students acclimatized. There was a bit of trauma, to be honest, people getting their heads around Zoom and those security issues that we had. We moved on to other platforms, Teams, Blue Jeans. We shifted around and made everybody agile, made sure that every lecturer had the equipment that they needed delivered to their home, uh, patched together iPads, phones. We just figured out, it was almost like, um, you know, in a war situation, let's think about England in World War II, where they were rationing and there was sort of everyone living in the tube stations and it was just a very, very uh, crazy time. But we followed a very strict protocol, which John developed because I mentioned earlier he's a strategist. I, I said to John the other day, you know, it's almost been like a privilege living through one of his lectures with real toys and real time. Uh, it's terrifying and challenging, but I can honestly say I've never been to a class this long and this big. Let's put that in context. How many students do you have or did you have before the crisis? Um, so um, I'm going to take some guesses now, but I, I know that by the end of the year, we will be a touch under 2,800. Um, I would imagine we've probably added, um, we probably will add, probably around 2,600 in the system before that. Because if you think about the new MBA intake being about 50 and then the other classes we've added, and we haven't finished registrations for the year. So currently around 200, 230 new students. Um, but that would mean we have around 2,800 students in the system um, at the moment. So that's a great deal of people that are gathering online um, and, and continue to achieve um, and, uh, and be rigorously um, you know, um, marked and checked and supported. We're now busy looking at rolling out some other student support. So we've got, uh, we've got some personal support for faculty members who are struggling because we find that there's now trauma. Um, we're finding that classes are being affected by COVID. People are losing family members. So now we're looking beyond the academics. We're looking at the personal development because that's the other thing about Henley's MBA. It's recognized around the world for being the most focused on personal development and mastery. So, so we have a huge PD element. 
And we just felt that it would be important for us to, we call it practicing what we teach. Um, 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 you know, we, we've got to make sure that we live the methodologies that we, and the curricula that we, we give to other people because they're going to use them in practice. When you were um, starting to put the list of things that you had to do together, it must have been an insanely long list. Um, I wanted to leave. <laughs> I wanted to resign about a week after I joined. Uh, it did seem impossible. And, and, um, so can you talk about that? Because I'm, I'm going to take yeah. a stab in the dark here and guess that you didn't use a waterfall project management methodology to get this one through. No, no. It's, uh, you know, we didn't have the time. And this is always the, the thing with project management stuff is do you have time to make the plan, to execute? Um, and so we cobbled together a whole lot of stuff. And we went back to uh, basics. Uh, we did lots of drawing. We did lots of rich pictures. We used uh, very cool tools. Miro is one of them. Uh, we used Stormboard. Uh, we used um, Graffle. Um, and we used a lot of uh, very fast uh, prototyping tools for mapping. Uh, so let's just, and, let's uh, just hold on that. So Stormboard, which were the other ones? Uh, Miro is the one we're using a lot now. Um, that's quite a good one. Uh, Ioya is a very good tool for uh, sort of meta planning. Um, and we also had found you, that... Had you ever used any of those tools before? No. Uh, I'd used Graffle briefly. Um, but what so we didn't did go rushing How did the for. procurement process work for um, getting out of these tools and starting to go and, and play with them? What was the, uh, the decision-making committee, the risk Who's management got a process? Card? That Who's was our approach. Card? Who's got a credit card? And let's just use that for now. We'll figure it out later. So, so, you know, those old processes, to your point, I mean, you can see that I'm not a legacy systems kind of human being at all. Um, I don't believe in the past. I think there are some useful things, but mostly what we've inherited from the past are deeply flawed ideas. And there's a simple reason for that. Uh, my belief system is that we came from the scientific and we are apes that have reiterated ourselves to the point that we are today. So, you know, you can't have an old iteration telling a new iteration what's possible because that's like an iPad 1 telling an iPad 4 what its apps are going to be. You just can't do that. You've got to stand on the edge of a, of a – you've got to look at the horizon and face forward. There's just no time to look back. And, and so we literally broke our own systems and, and saw what was left. And then we started to build from there because there's just no time to carry legacy in a time like this. If you want to go forward, I mean, if you want to really – you know, uh, we go to meetings now in the UK because they want to know what are we doing in Africa that's causing growth? They don't know. Uh, we, John allowed us to break systems. And, and so I no longer have the marketing department that I have. My, my department's just called Beta. And, and everybody knows that it's an iteration. We don't know what's going to happen next week. We don't have a three-month marketing plan anymore. We've got a marketing plan for the next sort of 10 days. Um, I've employed data science quite heavily, so I have a company that's helped me with that. I, I hear from them every second day. I have an early morning meeting to hear what the data science is telling us. Um, and we, we look at real-time user. We swam right downstream. Uh, we, we are right with the user. So we are watching every reaction to every post, everything we do uh, online. We watch the click-throughs. We watch the activity. We watch when. We watch how. If we send a mailer, we want to know exactly what they clicked on. So we're mapping all of that. And we're feeding that information straight into marketing. So, so it's adjusting as we go. And, and uh, you know, to your point, I mean, procurement, what a wonderful idea, you know, for peacetime when everything's healthy, maybe. But, I can, I'm on, you know, I'm happy to say that we, at the same time, um, we, we, have a, we have a philosophy we're developing called rapid diligence. And what that means is go faster, but go, 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 go right. So, so, you know, trust but verify. Um, nothing extraneous ultra lean, super agile, lots of little check-ins all the time. Uh, it's like spot welding along the way. Don't make, big, don't make big welds, just make small spot welds. Accept the fact that you'll launch six things, three, four might break, uh, but the other three will be super supported the moment we know that they've taken, they've got traction. Uh, listen to the audience. Um, so in a way, a lot of what a comic does, you know, a comedian puts out a, a line every 20 seconds and based on the reaction, uh, you know, we go from there. Fascinating. The team, um, I'm guessing, is a relatively small team. So there's yourself and John and five or six others that were at the core here. Yeah, yeah, it is can quite you, a small team. Yeah, yeah. Can, you, can you talk about, I mean, you make it sound um, like it was obviously quite chaotic. I can imagine it was hype, but I like that war room. Uh, could you talk about 
looking back, the model that was actually being used there, if there was one? Um, so all we really had was John's methodology uh, in innovation, and, and it's, it's one of his specialty areas. So we spoke, we always talk about, um, you know, there's a curve, there, there's an arc, and on this side of the arc is simplicity, which is no good because it doesn't address the complexity of the problem. Then in the middle, there's chaos. But in that chaos, there's processing going on, and it looks like a big mess. But what you end up with on the other side, if you follow John's kind of process, is an elegant simplicity. So it's a synthesis of what's come out of that chaos. So we, we knew that was important. Um, John knew that letting go was quite important, uh, letting the team run. And we came up with lots of ideas. The very first thing I did as a marketing guy was there were 21 days of lockdown announced. So immediately within 18 hours of the announcement, because he gave us that grace period to sort of get ourselves organized before the lockdown started, we immediately arranged 21 faculty members from all around the world to give us each one free lecture. We delivered that lecture on each day of the initial lockdown at the same time. And we gave it away because the idea was we need to give people something, number one, to focus on, um, um, you know, to, to, to keep them focused while they're in this kind of new chaos at home. We needed to keep them expanding their minds. We needed to let them know that they could keep learning throughout this lockdown and that we, we will remain committed not only to teaching, but teaching for free. <clears throat> and on that, we built a community of 4,000 registra registrants. And we were able to stay in touch with a whole lot of people um, at that time and already start to poll them, to ask them what they thought, what they were feeling, what they were looking for. And it allowed us to build a very quick view of, um, of what the psyche of our kind of market would be within lockdown and keep an eye on it during the process. And then obviously we have a research department, so they were doing quick research on what global trends were, what to expect, because other countries were ahead of us in the curve. And then John uh, also very quickly uh, started working with government on some very big plans about the rebuild of the economy, what skills would be needed, what parts of the economy would have to be stimulated. So he's very involved in, in a group that's advising government on, on, on some of that stuff, which is very, very um, it's very really useful because it allows him to get a macro view of, of what's going on. So, so it's a lot of action. It's not much sleep. Um, you've got to be brave. You've got to be resilient. Uh, it's really important. And you've got to learn to disagree with each other and then move on. You know, this is a huge thing. Is, um, what I learned is you get the best out of your team when you, when you disagree. This thing of diplomacy at a time like this is ridiculous. You've got to be respectful. You've got to, have, you've got to understand human rights. But for people like me, who've grown up on the fringe, I have, an, I have an, almost like an intrinsic understanding of, of that. I've just worked with some people in the drag community, drag artists. And what, what, what I'm so impressed by in the drag community is the level of empathy. What you have is a tribe of people who grew up being rejected. And what they formed as a result, and this goes back to negative drivers, what they formed as a result is this incredible amount of empathy that they share with each other and the world. If you ever watch like RuPaul's Drag Race, the overriding message and the appeal of that program to a wide audience is the level of, of um, empathy. And I believe as a marketer that you've got to, you've got to be hyper empathetic and you've got to understand and feel the audience and because marketing is not selling people stuff. It's about making people feel the story that you're telling. And, and, and so John is big on authenticity, which is why we don't exploit that database ever. We don't, we don't gather databases to spam. We gather to see where we can help. So we, we're now running a campaign as a result of this kind of process called Hidden Heroes. We're looking for South Africans to nominate other South Africans who've been, had barriers to education put in their way, whether it's prejudice, uh, whether it's economic barrier, whether it's um, academic barrier. And we are working to find ways that these people, provided they've done something for the community around them, so as long as they've had a positive impact on their ecosystem, we will go out of our way to try and help them to get the education that they qualify for, to get them up onto the ladder. And so that could be an MBA for someone who's more senior. It could just be an HCMP for someone who's got, you know, a matric years ago or wants to get their matric at a, at a late age and then wants to jump on the ladder. So, so we are very keen on, on doing that. So, so there's a big push um, to try and um, um, to explore empathy in Africa as, as, a, as, a, as a, you know, that's another part of the school is, we're big on empathy. Now, you did a lot of these things in a crisis. Now, there's nothing better than a good crisis to go and motivate change. Um, you are in a small group who trust each other. 
John's done a wonderful job of uh, bringing in some misfits and weirdos to go and get complimentary or uncomplimentary views to go and discuss. Some of the things that you've mentioned, um, incredible authenticity around your purpose and what you're trying to achieve. It's not chasing the numbers. Don't sell, try to help. We regularly argued and disagreed. We have to have open discord to come to uh, decisions. We move quickly. We experiment throughout the whole of the process. It sounds so magical. This is what you imagine in every well-functioning team and every high-performance company. Very few companies I know seem able to do half, let alone any of these things, in all honesty. What, what, yeah. Why is that? I just want to qualify. So it sounds amazing. Um, um, it really does. It's been traumatic. It's been deeply traumatic to get through this process. So I don't want to pretend that it's all been a really good sort of kumbaya adventure. Um, um, but, but what happens is when you have a great teacher at the core, um, th their job is to keep, and, I, and I, I'm only saying this because I teach and I, and I, and I, I really respect uh, what John's able to do in the classroom and I try to emulate that. But, but he keeps demanding better quality of thinking from the team and, and, and he, he's very vehement when it comes to, if you don't produce great thinking, he's quite vehement and he, he challenges you and he's really kind of, we were, we were joking about this yesterday. I said, you know, your, 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 your nurturing is quite ruthless. And, and uh, it's paradox. You know, he, he gets that. You've got to be a little bit ruthless when you're nurturing someone. And um, it's not about enabling their inability or their incapacity because that's not nurturing. That's something else. And so what I think is at the core of, of this thing is uh, it's not a comfortable way to learn things. It's, it's uncomfortable. But then discomfort becomes the, it's almost like that's how you measure the quality of the learning. If I'm not feeling slightly uncomfortable, or at least, sometimes deeply uncomfortable, uh, it's a problem. And the other thing is, uh, imposter syndrome constantly attacks the team because number one, we don't know because this is all new. And, and number two, uh, you know, imposter syndrome is often a sign of high functioning. Uh, it's, it's a symptom um, um, of high functioning because you almost, um, you know, I always think about that, uh, what's it called, the coyote and the roadrunner. You know, when the, when the coyotes run off the cliff in the cartoon, but there's a cloud of dust, he doesn't know he's off the cliff yet. And that's often the feeling is uh, you're not sure if you've left the clip. So, so um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, but how do you get that into the corporate environment? I mean, I agree. I mean, there is no question whether it's a crisis or a really good project that you're pulling together. Any sort of change is, is emotionally draining. Because if it's good change, you're doing something new, you're doing something you don't understand, you're doing something where you've got no baseline you're, you're dangling yourself out there, half hoping and working incredibly hard to make something happen out of it. So I fully agree that you've got to have this kind of imposter syndrome, this anxiety that's running with you that you're just heading off in the, in the wrong direction. But corporates seem to me to be an environment where it's so difficult to go and engage with people and build communities to get them into that, into that space, into that mindset. Yeah, well, now, this is why a lot of work with corporates before actually, um, you know, working with Henny there. What's your experience on that? What's your view as to why it's so difficult for these guys? Um, I think you need to admit weirdos into your system because weirdos bring with them uh, a new kind of order. And, and uh, I think that my experience of corporate South Africa as a whole, and this is over years of doing corporate gigs, by the way, and getting briefed by big corporations about their people and realizing that the people who brief me about their people, when I meet their people, have got no idea who their people are. It's, it's all based on, as I was saying, old information and old wiring, uh, which is why most of my teaching is about how to break those patterns and to uh, come, up with, uh, come up with fresh disruptive thinking. So I've always been a disruptive influence. I mean, I was thrown out of high school for exactly that. Now I'm paid quite a lot of money to go and talk to corporations about it. Um, um, so, so it's, it's about breaking the, the old value system because I think there's more value placed on politeness, for example, in the corporate space than actually interrogating an idea. So we play the corporate game with each other. And, and this is why I've never been good at golf. It's just too polite for me. That's a polite game. You know, you wander around, you take turns, you pick your stick, you hit the stick, you wear very smart clothes, you walk along on beautiful lawn. It's, it's way too polite for me. I, I'm, I'm much more into messiness. So, so, so um, and someone said to me the other day, life is messy. If you don't get any on you, you haven't lived. Um, um, so I think we need more mess, uh, more messy people in the corporate space, disrupting those old 
sort of um, um, structures that are based on the wrong, the wrong things. The new priorities are what's the truth? What's next? What is the nature of the problem? And, and it's, it's about downstream. See, we all want to solve it from our point of view. You, you've got to solve it from your customer's point of view. That's where, you know, my students' learning experience is my number one priority. I don't care what the university policies are. Provided I don't bend the rules on the accreditation, I want to know that the student is getting what they need in the way that they want it. And I think all products should be like that. Have you got any advice about how to bring that into, into the corporate world? I mean, let's uh, paint a... Um a scenario which may be familiar to people on the call. I'm, I, I hope not, but um, I'm the CEO of a large organization. I've been in that organization for many years or that particular industry. I feel very safe. I've built up my internal network. I feel very safe because I've got good relationships with my board and with the asset managers through to the investor community. It's stable. We've been making seven to 10% annual growth over the last five or six years. I don't, personally as the ceo of this organization for we're doing anything particularly wrong i don't want to rock the boat too much because i think that we're doing probably about the best that we can in fact we're we're up there with the joneses in our particular sector everything i've just described there for me is is literally just asking for a failure that goes slowly slowly quickly over the next five to ten years as technology and disruption comes through and the challenge is to at least in parts of the organization to change that paradigm to get people to feel as you've said unsafe to go and challenge these norms to remove bias from the organization to go and bring in misfits and weirdos to go and have very differentiated views and if you can't do that at least to go through transformation and get the same benefits and a yeah. thousand and one other things that you've described i'm not asking them to go to teal i'm not asking them to do holacracy i'm just saying come on we've got to get out there and have an outside in approach now you're running courses on this and you've just had this wonderful experience to learn from yourselves internally what advice do you have to try to go and get the CEOs to believe in this and to make the steps to go and make that kind of change, which for many is, is significant emotionally. Um, so I think I just read the, in fact, a book you recommended, Colin, I, I bought those books. I, I read the full and, and, uh, and uh, it was a very good uh, suggestion. Thank you. Um, in strategy, um, we look for asymmetries. This is where you find. I just say to everyone on the call, I gave them that recommendation about 48 hours ago. So uh, that's a quick, <laughs> that's a quick turnaround, John. But it was black box thinking. It was, uh, it was the four. I, I got those two. They were really good. Um, um, so in both those books, actually, you, you can extract this. Um, um, we look for asymmetry in strategy. If you're looking for a great disruptive strategy, find an asymmetry in the system. And one of the best asymmetries you can find is the upturned nose of the, the business that thinks it's established. Because uh, that's a great place to put a disruption is right under someone's nose. If you put it on the horizon, they see it coming. There are these like limitless appetite companies that are being born all the time. And they've got young, deeply ambitious, dangerous human beings who want to conquer not the world, but the virtual world, which is exponentially bigger. They're using data. They are reaching your customer before your customer gets out of bed by being on their phone, telling them what they were looking for the night before at a better price. So, so you know, these algorithms are hunting while these young CEOs are sort of, I don't know, doing whatever they do in, at Burning Man in America or taking ayahuasca and the, I don't know, whatever they're doing, right? But so, so you can be comfortable and you can be sure that, you know, slow but steady is the way forward. But unfortunately, there are more clever people coming into the system all the time. And we, greed is not slowed down. It's changed shape. But if you look at the way in which data is being gathered and analyzed now, never mind gathered because you will gather data, but, but the analysis of data and the application of machine learning to speed up and what's going on. If I just look at what we've done in a very small way with data science at Henley, because the truth is 3,000 customers a year, we're not a big, I mean, that's not a major business. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a small group, highly specialized, but, it, but it's a small group of people. Um, if I just see the difference we've made in, in starting to understand who we talk to and how we talk to them, one can only imagine in a big industry uh, business. Um, the next person who comes along, I always talk about this, it's the nature of things. You know, Trevor Noah eclipsed all of us as a comedian. Okay, but what's coming after him? What's the next turbine going to look like? If that's the next evolution, what's the next one going to be? And I think that's, that's what's interesting to me about businesses that don't want to change. Um, I've just canceled all the print media deals we had for um, the next six months. And I watched those industries flailing. I mean, they were absolutely safe as houses, right? And, and um, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a, an oversight on their part that's destroyed them. It's the rest of the world 
just getting on with it. And let me let me launch right. that poll um, that we talked about um, earlier. This is a quick one, and then you can and talk to this as we get the results. Um, do you believe? Do your beliefs typically hold you back or push you forward? I think this is a, a critical question that you come up with there, John. Hopefully, it's sharing on on the screens there. While they're answering that, do you want to talk about why we're asking that question about beliefs? Yeah, um, so this talks about legacy systems. And, and um, this came to me when I was doing a lot of work with banks. And they talk about the big uh, mainframes that they invested so heavily in. That in one hand, uh, it's a big cost, and it's a sunk cost. And we've got to like, I don't know if it's ever treated as a sunk cost, but it's there. And we have to now use it, you know. And so um, it holds them back. When you, when, you, when you whiteboard a bank from scratch, and you either... So, so basically time. technical debt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, um, and, and not only that, but now everything you think about implementing, you must implement through this legacy system. So it's already, um, it's already like, hobbled by the fact that it's got to be formatted in this way. So that doesn't allow you to kind of, you know, dream afresh. And, and uh, so it's the same with us, uh, Colin. I, I have very few beliefs in my life. I'm a very fluid human being. So I don't really know I'm not really sure what I, I don't have a big spiritual belief uh, system. I don't have a cultural background and um, my family may have, I, I, don't, I don't hold on to it. Um, I'm much more fo forward thinking. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's the way you have to be because, but what I have discovered about frameworks and all of the things I've spoken about are frameworks because ultimately we're a pattern seeking ape. That's exactly what we are. We are the best pattern seeker um, ape on this planet. And, and so we, we have, um, we have a great deal of power wrapped up in these frameworks because they're legacy systems. My question to most people is once you start to let go of that legacy system, what now becomes available? And, 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 and you know, the other problem is that a lot of people uh, don't, they can't see the world unless it's through the lens of those, those things. And we often judge other people's value systems uh, and then that's what forms our perception of them rather than questioning our own value system. Because once we do that, you start to see other people in a different light. And that becomes a critical uh, part of disruptive thinking, is if you cling to something that you think defines the world, it doesn't. Um, you know, I, I always show in my classes a painting, and I ask the class what they think the painting is worth. And it's a, it's a Gerhard Richter, it's worth between 15 and $20 million, depending on who buys it. <clears throat> And then I get that reaction of like, oh, that's ridiculous. Well, you might think so, but that's going to sell at an auction. That's going to happen. That transaction is happening. And what that's about is uh, you can have your values, but the rest of the world doesn't care about your values. It values itself on its values. So becoming a disruptive thinker means you've got to let go of that. And, and how, but how do you let go? That, that's the question, isn't it? Because it's safe, it's comfort. I've been there for yeah. 20 or 30 years. And you want me to step over here. I know I've got to step over here. I can see the Googles and the Teslas of the world. They're, they're leading the path. But yeah. I'm here. I, how, how do you do that? Well, you know, I'm not sure why I was born the way I am. But, um, but I, I, I tend to be able to do it. Um, um, I walked away from comedy when I was kind of really successful. I didn't have a terrible, like, slow patch and then walk away because there was no other option. I wanted to kill it at the, at the, at the peak. So I actually ended my, my very last night ever was an arena show in Cape Town with some friends of mine. It was a really cool show and uh, it really hurt. Actually, I didn't know it was going to punch me in the guts the way it did, but uh, it really hurt to know that I was closing the door and then turning down offers for gigs um, when they came in and uh, opportunities. But, but for me, it's easy for me to teach disruption, but I have to walk the talk. I had to do it. And, and so... I gave up on drink and drugs 15 years ago, and that was a big pattern that I broke. Uh, I gave up on meat about well, 12 years ago. Uh, recently, about a year ago, I gave up all animal products. I keep breaking patterns that I'm comfortable with. I love dairy. I thought it was one of the best foods ever. Um, but I decided to live without it. And, um, you know, I decided to live without whiskey and cocaine. I mean, I, that was a, those are things I was really, really, I believed I would use until I died. I nearly did, actually. Um, I also thought I would have a father forever, but he ended that pattern. Oh, it wasn't his fault, but um, life ended that pattern. So, so we talk about the fact that it's hard to give things up, but, but the truth is, I mean, I come from a very religious family, for example, but I, I made a decision at a certain age that I wouldn't do that. And um, it was quite a hard decision because I was hardwired to believe that if I did that, I was committing a really, really dangerous 
uh, uh, crime against the system. And then I had a daughter uh, who lived with me and so she's just gone to university now. Uh, we're still very close. But I wasn't sure if raising my daughter without a religious belief was maybe irresponsible. Um, but I did it conscientiously and I gave her a choice uh, at the age of, you know, when she was able to decide, I said, whatever religion you want to be part of, I will support you and I'll take you there and I will get you the books and I'll listen and I will you know, support you. I just can't do it. And she hung back and, and um, you know, I, I'm, it's, it's complicated because these patterns... Okay, we're going we're gonna, to go and simplify it because you're only going to be allowed to say yes or no. Right? Now, at the start, I asked if anyone could become a comedian and your answer was no. I'm hoping the answer is going to be yes on this question because there's a lot of people working in the corporate environment. Do you think it's possible for people to make that transition so that they become open, outside in, put themselves into situations which are disruptive and emotionally challenging, use subservient leadership, be of that mindset where even a leadership position, the biggest skill you can have is to ask the right questions and not to try to pretend to know all the answers. Do you think everyone can move into that space? I'm, I'm rooting that you're going to say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to cop out a little bit. I'm going to quote Nelson Mandela and just say that the answer is in your hands because you have the power to step out. Uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily have the capacity to make that choice because of fear, because of paralysis, because of judgment, because of... But I can tell you that I, you, have, you have the capability. And the reason I know that is because uh, when my dad had the stroke, I studied a lot about the brain. The brain is a, a wonderful thing called neuroplasticity, which means you're able to burn new pathways through uh, neurons that have never performed that task before until the moment you die. And that's why stroke victims are temporarily paralyzed. And they don't, they don't regenerate the, the brain so it doesn't happen. But they teach the brain teaches new neurons to fire up to achieve the same result. And, and um, so you can ch literally change your mind until the moment you die. Um, I don't think being brave is the same as the choice we, uh, you know, you, I say you can't be, not everyone can be a comedian, but I, I believe everybody has the capacity for bravery, courage, because that's all you need. You just have to have the courage, you know, and, and if you rationalize it correctly, I mean, the truth is my mom is a deeply religious woman. My business partner is a deeply, deeply charismatic Christian lady, and I love her very much, and I, and I support her framework because it works for my friend, and I see the results in her, grace, forgiveness, kindness, uh, she's understanding, she's compassionate, so it brings out wonderful things in my friend, and therefore for her, it's perfect, um, um, and uh, I also get the benefit, I always uh, joke with her because I say, as an atheist, I get the real benefit of heaven because she believes in it, so she treats me well because she wants to go there, so I get treated well on this planet. Uh, but I don't have to follow the rules. That's the perfect outcome of a framework. That's why I'm going to support my friend's belief. Um, um, but we don't do that enough. We judge each other's frameworks. Um, every human, um, it doesn't matter what you believe. It's the fact that you can believe. It's your, it's your ability to believe that empowers you. So, so um, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. And I think, um, yes, we all have the ability to step outside of what we've been taught uh, is the truth. A couple of questions here from the audience. That was about as close as I was going to get to a yes or no, wasn't it, John? So we'll, we'll take it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, now, we've got um, a lot of people that are called anonymous here. So do you bring comedy in the workplace uh, with your business and personnel? And if you do, extending their question, how beneficial is it to bring comedy into the workplace? Yeah, it's, it's very important. Um, um, uh, I think humor is a magnificent uh, social um, tool. Um, it's very important. And it's a coping mechanism as well for stress. Uh, when the team is under pressure or I'm under pressure or, you know, when things seem hopeless, uh, it's really good to be able to laugh. Uh, it's, it's massively important. So yes, I, I would never ever not, like, I would never cheat myself of comedy. I'm just not doing it on stage. Um, another one here, you talk about active um, hypocrisy personal development i think it says that personal development and mastery how do we shift it's a little bit where we're just chatting about how do we shift behaviors and thinking in a corporate environment to de-shackle us from the old way of doing things i suppose we didn't really quite answer that we've said that it's in our in ourselves that we can do this but there's tool sets that people like consultants and um, catalysts and henley business school are showing people to go and 
push them into that space. One is create a sense of crisis and you're living a real one, which has really opened your guys' minds. Other ways that you can push people into to finding it? Yeah, so I think that's exactly it. So it talks to your last point is stepping outside of norms. I think you're right. The crisis is a rearrangement of energy and a rearrangement of energy provides a new uh, a context. And so that's, a, that's an excellent way to do it. Another way you can do it is to um, find the activists within your organization um, because what they do is they provoke and you must, you must encourage that, uh, encourage activists, uh, but you've got to contain them and that's the role of leadership. So a nuclear reactor is brilliant until you break the container and then it's a, it's a huge disaster. But when it's contained and it's got integrity, uh, it's a really clean, clever way to generate energy. So, so um, my thing is to turn your team into a reactor. You've got to all... You've got to be able to hold that reaction in place. You can't judge each other. You can't fight. You can't argue to win. You've got to robustly test ideas to find the best answer. Don't ever enter to win. It's such a bad idea. That's not, that's not thinking. That's boxing. Um, um, and so, so I think that's important. And, and try your best to be your own activist. Um, that's very important to me. Take a stand. Find a pattern that you, that you, that you, you recognize around yourself and break that pattern. And just see what the results are. Um, and do it as regularly as you can. It becomes second nature. Um, you'll learn to suspend judgment. Um, I, I love the fact that I can pretty much go anywhere with anyone. And, and I, I just don't find myself being very judgy. Um, so that's quite good. I think South Africans have got a very high horse that we, we ride on a lot. And it's because of our past, because of our polarization. There are lots of reasons. But we can't keep blaming those things. You know, we, South Africans are not great on social media. We tend to take each other down instead of extending each other's things. Uh, uh, Bishop Tutu said, don't raise your voice, raise the quality of your argument. And um, um, it's a beautiful, uh, I'm a huge fan of, of Bishop Tutu, what a, what a great leader. A lot, a lot of your um, history and your examples, you've talked about religion, uh, your family, and your polling question there about belief. Um, and how important is belief? I'm going to reword it as how important is purpose in actually instigating change and, and giving people change? And what would be the comparative compared to, say, a profit-driven or a metric-driven organization? Is there any difference? Um, that's a really good question. I think, um, I think purpose is almost everything uh, for me. Um, but but I want to I make it a bit of a paradox and say you, you don't have to be – a purpose is not an outcome. That's the first thing. Uh, a purpose is a practice. So try and see having purpose as a practice. Again, back to my idea of having a belief system is useful. Um, um, you know, it's the fact that you can believe. So, so because at the moment I can't tell you, um, no, that's not true. I can't tell you what my purpose is now. But there was a time when I didn't know. All I knew was I had to stop doing comedy and bravely walk onto a new road. I didn't know what it was. Um, and, uh, and that's formed over time. Uh, but, um, um, but it's very important that we, we, we have purpose um, and also a set of rules, you know, we, we've, got to, we've got to agree on some rules as human beings because another thing we do in South Africa is we love equal rights for ourselves, but not for everyone else. And equity is a very strange concept in South Africa as evidenced by the arguments around a land a redistribution. Um, the bottom line is there's a massive um, uh, inequity uh, problem in South Africa and in all over the world. But we talk about equal rights, we talk about equity, but when it comes down to actually getting our wallets out, we are not so big on equity. Um, and again, it's not because we're evil, it's because we're acquisitive apes. We, we are built on our ability to acquire surplus. That's what makes us the winner. Um, in fact, we, we consume two and a half Earth's worth of Earth every year. What the Earth can produce, we eat two and a half times of that in resources. So, so we're on track to be on three by 2030. But... Um, but it's a, so, so it's, it's, it's a constant wrestling with our own thing. So if you can focus on purpose and, and, and make it a, a purpose that you, you've checked out from an integrity point of view, everything else will flow. You know, Henley, we, we followed purpose. We gave things away in the beginning of COVID. And now we've seen extra, um, and so, you know, people are buying more MBAs than ever before. I'm going to give you this question and at the same time invite militia to uh, join us i'm just uh, hitting the start video but i think this is a great question i mean it you could look at it and say it's a bit flippant i actually think there's depth to this question can i still be successful and disrupt although i like to play golf i think that's a brilliant question a hundred percent of course you can in fact what better place to be disruptive than a golf club i mean 
they won't even let me in at country clubs. Um, so what a wonderful place to play a round of golf and then cause some mayhem. It's a great idea. Uh, if you I don't can go around in a polo shirt and wear chinos, and in <laughs> theory, you're very sensible and boring. If that's a bad stereotype for golf players, I'm really sorry. But if that's your character set, can you be in a corporate environment and disruptive, you know, and uh, be the next Elon Musk? So... So I think the future is going to happen to be a quick answer because otherwise we're going to overflow on our time. I'm sorry. Sure. No, I, um, I think the future will be defined by people who look a little bit more like this than by people who look like um, the ones who wrecked the world so far. Love the answer. Melisha, welcome. Thank you, Colin. Hi, John. Hi. So much of what you've spoken about has resonated with me, especially as I try to raise my children with the saying, why fit in when you were born to stand out? I think Dr. Seuss was, was masterful. Mm -hmm. I'm also of the view that, that empathy is based on the school of hard knocks, right? I also believe it's a very powerful emotion. Do you think empathy can be taught? I don't think you teach empathy. I think that you resonate empathy. Um, I, I don't believe people learn the theory of empathy. I think they feel, yeah, if you resonate it, then, then we get it. And I think that's why so many figures in history have, have, have created um, movements. For example, Nelson Mandela, you felt him. You didn't, and you could listen, but you really felt the idea. Bishop Tutu, I suppose in a way, Gandhi, I've got mixed feelings about Gandhi because I know his true history, um, and that, but certainly the impact he had on the world. So, so I feel like we've got, to, we've got to resonate empathy as opposed to teach it. No, thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Um, it was incredibly insightful. Thank you, Colin, for facilitating the session. And just a shout out and special mention to our clients who have joined us today, AB InBev, Standard Bank, Tracker, AfriSAM, to name but a few. I think we recognize that your time is invaluable, for, so thank you for spending it with us. Please look out for next week's IOKO Inspire Series event with Anton Musgrave, a futurist, business strategist, entrepreneur, and businessman at 12 o'clock next week. Once again, thank you, everybody. Goodbye, and please be safe. Yeah, and thank you very much, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure again. Just in the uh, two minutes or so before we actually uh, cut the line, John, the last question, I prepped you for this at the start. Just give me your two or three recommendations for leadership. Let's give them some hope before they go off and so live their working from home lives. Do not ask a question when you expect to know what the answer is. That's not a question. You're leading a witness. That's the first thing. <laughs> um, secondly, uh, I want to quote John Foster Pedley. When I said to him, John, at this point, one day I was under pressure. And I said, John, I've never felt so incompetent in my life. And he said, thank God. I've been waiting for someone else to feel the same way. <laughs> so inco feeling incompetent is not a bad thing. Um, so that's important. And then... Um, and then I think finally, uh, just a little piece of wisdom from uh, addiction, because I think that's a great source of wisdom. Uh, suffering is important. Uh, addiction isn't something you beat, it's something you dance with. And the reason I mention that is uh, you will never get to an absolute state of being right, but you can dance with it. Keep dancing. Wise pieces of advice. I'm going to add a fourth one. On, uh, and just while I read that one back, if everyone can leave their feedback on the chat. Uh, there was a question earlier about whether this video would be made available. Absolutely. It's going to be posted up on the IOCO website, I think, in the next day or two. So you should be able to go and get access to it uh, soon enough. And the quote that, or the, the sentence that I like, the one I'm going to take away is this. Purpose is a direction. Profit is an outcome. I like that. Thank you very much for your time and we'll speak to you soon. Everyone else out there, please be safe. Thanks, Colin.